Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our webinar. We're not just going to be talking about when commercial conveyancing transactions go wrong, but we hope giving you some tips how to avoid them going wrong in the first place and also how to deal with them when it does go wrong. We're going to be covering four key topics. Firstly, I will be speaking about when time is of the essence. Alex will speak on the second and third topics, notices to complete and specific performance. And I will conclude by dealing with the retention of deposits. We're going to hopefully allow five minutes for questions, uh, depending upon how our timing works out. Uh, but if we run out of time, our email addresses are going to be on the final slide and are available on the website. So please do write to us with any questions. So to turn uh, to the first topic, I'm going to start by asking you to imagine a scenario. You're the partner supervising the conveyancing department. You're in your office. It's the Friday before Christmas. The next working day is a bank holiday. You receive a call. Your heart sinks. The call is from the conveyancer who's dealing with your most important developer client and she's not able to make it back to the office. She went out for a lunch, that was a big mistake, and a demonstration has taken place. The police have blocked the streets. They're unsympathetic to her pleas to get back to complete the transaction. Tick, tick, tick. You're in the position where the deadline has passed. What do you do? Well, in, in talking through this scenario, I'm going to start off by looking uh, at what it means for time to be of the essence uh, and then talk through uh, the impact of time being the essence uh, and um, the particular issues that can arise in relation to this scenario. So to start off with, I'm going to talk about what time of the essence means. Um, we're all familiar with the phrase, but just by way of recap, it means it's a failure to perform the obligation in the time specified by the contract, and that puts the defaulting party in breach of the contract. And of course, the consequence is the innocent party uh, can uh, rescind the contract and put the part defaulting party in breach of contract. Uh, and of course, the consequence is that damages will be claimed. It should be noted that merely including a date does not make time of the essence. That's long established. The authority is Stickney and Keeble. And what's required is an express provision. The well-known case of United Scientific Holdings Limited and Burnley Borough Council, 1978 appeal cases 904 established that principle. And in looking at whether the contract provides that time is of the essence, the normal contractual principles well known uh, from authorities such as Arnold and Britain will apply. Uh, the issue is what was the intention of the parties in the factual matrix that occurred. But it is likely, and do note this, um, that an explicit clause will be taken at face value. So the first step in the nightmare scenario with the missing conveyancer, who's been put off lunch for life, uh, requires consideration of the contract. So moving on to... So what makes time of the essence, Kerry? Yeah. Well, what, what makes time of the essence um, is, first of all, a position where the contract says uh, that it should be expressly stated to be such. But before uh, you are uh, in the position of heaving a sigh of relief if you are the supervising partner in the scenario I've set out, bear in mind that performance by the specified date is a condition, uh, can also include a condition or a condition precedent. Uh, and really what's key is that you've got key clear uh, stipulation that the contract is void if it's not performed within a specific time. Uh, and to sound a further note of caution, time is of the essence um, may arise because of the nature of the property or the surrounding circumstances. Uh, a couple of examples of reported cases are firstly where the sale of a reversion may become an estate in possession during the delay, 
at Newman and Rogers, uh, or where the nature of the property is of a wasting nature, such as a lease hold property, which has got a very short unexpired term. And that's uh, the case of Hudson and Temple. In those cases, the date of completion fixed by the contract was held to be of the essence. Um, and what is required is a fixed date or one that's capable of precise determination by the contract. And so what about the position where the language in the contract is, is more vague, using language such as on or before? Well, it's been held to mean that time was of the essence in a case of Lock and Bell, but in the more authoritative case of James McMara Limited and Barclay, 1945, King's Bench 148, uh, the Court of Appeal firmly took the view that the words on or before did not make time of the essence. Uh, really, the key question in all cases is what's the construction uh, of the contract using normal contractual principles. By way of guidance, um, it's far more likely to be inferred where the contract concerns a wasting asset, such as a short lease. So in Pitt's Leisure Productions Limited in Walton, 1982, 43 PNCR 415, uh, even a reference to using best endeavours was held to imply that time was of the essence because the subject of the sale was a wasting asset, uh, it's unlikely uh, to have been a decision reached on, on the basis of that language were it not a wasting asset. Moving on to the next slide, um, as you'll be aware, even absent any clause making time of the essence, a defaulting party which unreasonably delays can be served with a notice uh, by the innocent party making time uh, of the essence. Now, Alex is going to deal with that in more detail in the next part of the session. Um, we also ought to consider, can, uh, is it possible to waive clauses stating time is of the essence? It has been held in a number of cases that parties can waive such a, a provision, either expressly or impliedly, a couple of cases there, Hunton, Mahoney, um, and uh, there are a couple of others uh, as well. Um, and so please note if a party states explicitly that time is no longer of the essence, or they conduct themselves in a manner that's inconsistent with time being of the essence, uh, it may well be argued that time is no longer material and, and it's been waived. It's important also, though, to bear in mind that the position can again be reversed. Uh, time can be made essential again if the waiving party gives notice to the other party and a couple of conditions are met. First of all, the indication has to be um, that there's an intention to insist on compliance with the time frame, but also it's essential that there's an appropriate amount of time which is available. And the authority for that is American Hawaiian Engineering um, and uh, Construction Co. and Butler, uh, and Powell and Cannon. As such, always keep an eye on time limits. And so to turn to the final uh, slide on this section, what is the impact of making time of the essence? If time is of the essence, then the defaulting party is of course vulnerable to a claim for breach of contract and rescission, etc. Now to apply that to the scenario that we spoke about earlier, I'd just like you to imagine a position where on scrutiny of the contract, the worried conveyancing partner has concluded uh, that there is a condition precedent, time is of the essence, the deadline has passed. And I'll leave you with the thought what happens next um, before I return to it in the final part of our session when I talk about retention of deposits. But at this stage, I'm going to move on uh, to introduce Alex, who's going to address the next topic. Hi there. Thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, good morning all on this chilly November day. Uh, I've also got a scenario for you to picture. So I want you to picture the scene as a new client comes into your office. 
and looking dishevelled and in a state of panic. As he sits off opposite him, the smell of spice rum comes across the table and he recounts the night before. He was at an early office Christmas party and uh, also in attendance at that Christmas party were some prospective purchases for his warehouse. The client's been negotiating with these purchases for two weeks. Uh, after a few spiced Christmas sours, uh, his recollection of the evening gets a little bit hazy. When he awakes the next day, he finds signed contracts for sale at, for his warehouse at only 70% market value. Fairly bad hangover. He's now worried that the purchasers will attempt specific performance. What do you advise? Well, the answer to that hopefully infrequent problem and many more will be addressed in my segments today on notices to complete and specific performance. And to clarify, uh, during this segment, I'm gonna be asking for some limited audience participation. And don't worry, you don't have to come on the screen or, or even enter the chat. There'll just be some anonymous polls uh, which you can do using your phone with some QR codes at the relevant time. So I'll firstly be discussing notices to complete. And now, for those of you involved in conveyancing, you'll know that these are very important notices. Uh, the implications of failing to comply with a notice to complete can be very significant, or indeed for the lawyers, ensuring that the notice is itself valid in the first place. And these could have significant financial implications. Uh, so in respect of notices to complete, I'll be covering the following points. Uh, standard commercial property conditions. Uh, what does it mean to be ready, able and willing? What are the consequences of failing to complete in time? And does time remain of the essence after the notice to complete period expires? So Alex, I'd like to ask, uh, what do the standard commercial conditions of sale provide? Uh, in relation to notices to complete? Um, so to clarify, there are, of course, the, the normal standard conditions of sale, and those are often incorporated in commercial transactions. Uh, but the standard commercial conditions of sale are the ones that I'm going to be referring to today. The, the, the provisions, as far as they concern, uh, notices to complete are, in fact, quite similar. Um, so they're all, all almost identical. They're just the numbers have changed. But the, that's what I'll be discussing today. So these are paraphrased slightly. but. 9.1.1 provides that effectively time is not of the essence unless a notice to complete has been served. And 9.8.1, a party who is ready, able and willing to complete uh, may give the other a, a notice to complete. And 9.8.2, uh, the party is to complete that contract within 10 days. And so for that purpose, for those 10 days, uh, time is of the essence. And it's important to note that once a notice to complete is served, it cannot be unilaterally withdrawn. So there's a need to ensure when you are serving that you really are ready, able and willing. And um, why is being ready, willing and able important, Alex? Uh, so if the party serving the notice is not ready, able and willing, the notice to complete may be invalid. And so the party giving the notice will not be entitled to rescind the contract. And that could mean the difference of a seller keeping a buyer's deposit or not. So it could have substantial implications. And, and what does ready, willing and able mean? Well, ready, able and willing broadly means a party has complied with all of its primary obligations or is in a position to do so. Uh, ready, willing and able is a 1937 musical in which producers cast an amateur co college student who can't sing instead of an intended star actress. Uh, but there is a distinction between primary and secondary obligations and a notice to complete uh, will not be invalidated just because there may be outstanding secondary obligations. Could you give an example of a secondary obligation? Uh, so in the case of Hanson and Southwest Electricity Board, uh, part of the contract was to construct the property. Uh, this was completed. After this was done, the property was to be exchanged. The buyer had a legitimate complaint about the quality of some of the works and as such a claim for breach of implied term of satisfactory quality. However, it was held that that was a secondary obligation and it did not invalidate the seller's notice to complete. 
And what about all primary obligations? Does the party giving notice have to discharge these by the time of giving notice? Uh, not necessarily. As long as it is in a position to comply with its primary obligations before the expiry of the notice, the notice can still be valid. For example, a seller may be ready, able and willing, even though the property is not yet vacant, provided that it is in a position to secure vacant possession before the expiry of the notice. And what are the consequences of non-compliance with the notice to complete? Well, these are prescribed by the conditions, but in short, uh, if a buyer fails to complete, the seller may rescind, may keep the deposits and interest, uh, resell property and claim damages. Uh, and if the seller fails to complete, uh, then the buyer may rescind and get his deposit repaid with interest. Note, however, the wording is may rescind. A failure to complete is, is not an automatic termination. Uh, one of the parties needs to uh, confirm that that's what they're intending to do, or the innocent party needs to. And does time remain of the essence after the expiry of the notice to complete period? So this issue was addressed in the case of uh, Hakimze and Swales, and the court held that the seller was not entitled to terminate in that case. Um, in that case, a seller failed to complete by the expiry of a buyer's notice to complete, as a, as a tenant had remained in the property beyond the expiry of that notice. But the buyer didn't rescind the contract, Two days later, the tenant left and the seller confirmed uh, as much to the purchaser and sought to complete that day. Uh, but the buyer requested an inspection which couldn't take place for another week. Uh, the seller then tried to terminate itself, saying the buyer had failed to complete while time remained of the essence. Uh, the court held that the seller was not entitled to terminate, uh, the effect being that uh, time of the essence is just for until effectively the end of the notice to complete period. And that fixes a time for performance, a failure of which uh, constitutes a repudiatory breach. Time doesn't continue to remain of the essence after this date, even if the innocent party does not accept the repudiatory breach. Well, thank you, Alex. Um, you've discussed uh, these uh, issues in terms of notice to complete. Moving on to uh, other options open to an innocent party after completion, uh, what, what other options are available after completion passes? Well, yeah, the other part of the topic, uh, of my topics are its specific performance. So specific performance is the obvious other remedy beyond a notice to complete. Uh, and why might this be preferable to a notice to complete? Well, this is likely to be the key remedy to advise your client about if they are a buyer and in particular if they want to uh, keep the property. In that case, the buyer probably doesn't want to rescind the contract. They, they want the property itself. They don't want it to terminate and get their deposit back. Alternatively, you may have a seller who thinks that they've got a really good deal and they want to, uh, they want to enforce on the terms that they've agreed uh, and they prefer that to keeping the deposit. Um, so you'll need to advise them about what, whether specific performance is available. And so what, what I'll be discussing in relation to this will include the following, which is the threshold for specific performance and bars to specific performance. And that's not exhaustive, we're not going to be discussing all different types of bar, uh, just a handful. And that'll include misrepresentation, uh, mistake, a default by the claimant in seeking specific performance, uh, time limits and delay, and great hardship. Could you just remind us, what is specific performance? Uh, sorry, I, I know this may be obvious for, for many of you, but it's a decree by the court to compel a party to comply with its obligations. It's an equitable remedy, meaning that the usual equitable principles apply. Now that's important in relation to bars to specific performance. And um, what is the threshold for ordering specific performance? Uh, the threshold as a general rule is that uh, where there's a valid contract, where damages would not be an adequate remedy. And so in this way, specific performance is often regarded as exceptional as the vast majority of of contractual breach cases, damages will be adequate. Um, the most common case in which the court almost invariably does order specific performance is sales of land, and that's because no two pieces of land are identical. But it is possible that arguments could be made that if it's a commercial investment or if it's an identical flat in numerous blocks of flats, uh, then there may be an argument about the threshold, but there's not really much pre precedent for, for defeating a claim on, in English law in relation to that. Um, we can understand why this would be uh, applicable for purchasers, but wouldn't damages be an appropriate remedy for sellers? 
So as the court will not interfere with one uh, in favour of one party alone, a seller can maintain an action for specific performance, even though damages may give them a complete remedy. Uh, and as stated, the vast majority of the time, the threshold for an order for specific performance will be met. So it then just becomes a question of whether there is a bar to specific performance. And would a mistake be a bar to specific performance? So this is one of the points that I, I highlighted earlier that I've been uh, discussing. And so, yes, it can be. Uh, it's been refused where parties have been under a common misapprehension. It's been refused where the mistake is unilateral on the basis that the claimant has contributed to the defendant's mistake. And it's even been refused in cases where the mistake was purely that of the defendant. In particular, where it would be highly, the relief would be highly unreasonable or would cause a hardship amounting to injustice. And so now I have a question for you, the audience. Uh, some of you may recall uh, the episode of Friends, uh, where Joey accidentally buys a Catalina 22 in a silent auction, uh, thinking that he was just supposed to guess the, the price of the boat. The Mr. Beaumont. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, assuming that this was a piece of land, uh, so the thresholds reached um, for the purposes of this question, um, would Joey be forced to buy the boat? That's the question. And so uh, you can see here. Hopefully that's come up. Oh. One moment. And hopefully there'll be a QR code there. Okay, apologies. Slight technical issue here. All right, well, we'll move on. In short, the answer is, it's not clear. Um, a specific performance was refused in the case of Mallins and Freeman, uh, where the purchaser bid for and bought one lot at auction in the belief that he was buying a totally different lot and would have been a great hardship on him to compel him to take the property. And, uh, but that, that's, so, there, so in that case, Joey would be forced to buy her, so I wouldn't be forced to buy the boat. But in the case of uh, Tamplin and James, a uh, specific performance was granted uh, where a purchaser bought an inn and a shop at auction in the mistaken belief that there were two plots at the back which formed part of the property. Uh, so the particulars of sale and the plan exhibited at the property, and this is because, sorry, the particulars uh, described the property correctly. And so in that case, if that line of authority was followed, Joey uh, wouldn't, would be forced to buy the boat. In my view, that's probably the more likely of the case, assuming that uh, the, the, the fact that it was a silent auction uh, was adequately described. Um, but it may depend on the judge on the day, and we are relying on cases which are over 150 years old now. So in what circumstances would a possible misrepresentation or non-disclosure prevent specific performance? Uh, so, any misrepresentation, uh, whether it's fraudulent or innocent, which justifies the rescission of the contract, affords a defence to specific performance, even if it affects only a small part of the contract. And, so, and even if that right is then lost, provided that this is not the innocent party's fault. Uh, mere silence does not prevent specific performance. Uh, however, where that's coupled with conduct which suggests the claimant has an unfair advantage, the court may refuse. And there are other vitiating factors that may render uh, a contract voidable, such as duress, undue influence and unconscionability, which can also be relied upon to resist specific performance. What about a claimant who is in breach of its obligations? So default by a claimant seeking specific performance is a common defence to specific performance. A, a claimant who seeks to enforce must show that he has performed and is ready, able and willing to perform all terms and conditions 
apart from trivial ones. Uh, so, for example, in relation to a vendor, uh, in a buyer, it's, it's slightly more obvious, but in relation to a vendor, the, the failure to perform often falls into three categories. That includes uh, that they don't have title, uh, that the property is subject to encumbrances which should have been disclosed, and that the vendor's title, although bad, is doubtful. Uh, and so in those circumstances, specific performance is not usually enforced. Uh, unless the defect can be cured um, before the purchaser has, purchaser has terminated the contract effectively. And can a claimant still seek specific performance even if they fail to complete by the completion date? Uh, in short, yes, uh, as long as time is not of the essence. Um, but if time is of the essence, then no, they, they wouldn't be able to because that would be a breach of of a, of, a, um, of, a, of a key term. And I think you're going to be referring to the case of Union Evil later, which touches on, on that point. Yes. Uh, and what about um, if um, there's no prompt application for specific performance? So uh, specific performance can be barred by a claimant's unreasonable delay in seeking the, the specific performance remedy under the equitable doctrine of latches. Um, it was traditionally thought to be the case that a claimant in this situation had to be uh, a very prompt and, and, um, and, and so uh, any, any delay in that regard was, was, uh, was a possible defence. But now the, the situation softened slightly and a delay alone is not usually sufficient to bar specific performance unless the defendant has been prejudiced by the delay. What about great hardship if specific performance would uh, involve great hardship? Does that affect the outcome? So, uh, yes, because specific performance is an equitable remedy, uh, then if it would be a great hardship on the defendant, the courts will often not grant it. Um, so we do have another slido question here. Maybe that this, let's see if this will work. But if not, then we'll just move on a moment. One minute, I think it's working. Not sure I can see the results though. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I've got it now. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna give you another 10 seconds. And all right. Okay, so we have 50%, 57% or 54% of you uh, say that uh, they wouldn't be forced to buy it. And the important, well, one of the interesting things to say was that purchasers weren't forcing the drinking, but 46% of you think that uh, they may be forced to still purchase it. Okay, interesting. All right. So there's two cases on this. Uh, one is an Australian case, and it says, or uh, what was found in that case is that uh, the seller, uh, uh, the specific performance was refused against the seller who was sodden with rum, uh, who had contracted to sell his property at an undervalue to purchasers who knew about it. Uh, and this was because uh, it, they exploited his intoxication by bringing a bottle of rum. I think he was a known alcoholic. But actually, even in the situation or the, the uh, question that was asked where it wasn't encouraged by the seller, in an English case, Martin, Matt Mullins and Freeman, again, quite an old case, uh, the defendant, uh, a specific performance was, was refused, even though the defendant may not have been drawn into drink by the claimant. So in those circumstances, uh, it's likely that a court uh, would refuse specific performance in relation to uh, your client's warehouse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. I'm now going to deal with the final uh, section uh, of the talk on retention of deposits. Um, and we've already assumed that time was of the essence in the scenario I gave earlier. So. I'm now going to focus on what the options are in terms of what can be done next. And I'm going to start off by considering some of the established principles uh, and summarising when a deposit can be retained. I'm then going to consider how that differs where there's been a part payment of the deposit, 
when the court will require a deposit to be returned. And finally, I'm going to turn to some of the most current issues, uh, which I think are the most interesting, uh, namely when a deposit is a penalty, uh, because that's something of a hot topic at present. So moving on to uh, the first of those topics. So can a deposit be retained? In, in short, the general starting proposition is yes. Um, that's because deposits are paid as a guarantee, an earnest or security for performance. And if it's not performed, the starting position is that it can be retained. And this applies to most deposits, which conventionally are known to be 10%. Um, and which form part of the uh, purchase price unless the contract provides to the contrary. And the, the starting position, the conventional position, is that the deposit is forfeited if the uh, purchaser fails to complete in accordance with the contract. And uh, although uh, no express forfeiture clause is required, uh, most uh, are carried out under the standard conditions uh, and so provide for such. Uh, what's the position if a deposit is required uh, but not paid or partly paid? Well, early authority suggested the vendor couldn't sue for the balance in the case of part payment, that's low and home. Um, however, um, the position is now clear from Johnson and Agnew, 1979, two weekly law reports, 487. The House of Lords confirmed the unpaid deposit can be recovered as damages. And it's important to note, of course, that the court's got a wide and general discretion conferred by Section 49 of the Law of Property Act, 1925, to order return of the deposit. And in considering such cases, it'll take into account a variety of factors, which include the conduct of the parties, the size of the deposit, uh, the seriousness of the matters in question, uh, but there's no requirement to show that the vendor has misconducted themselves. Can you give some examples of the approach of the court directing the return of the deposit? Well, famously, uh, in Union, Eagle Star and Golden Achievement Limited, 1997 Appeal Cases 514, it was held that payment of the purchase price a mere 10 minutes after completion um, enabled rescission of the contract and forfeiture of the deposit. So that's not looking very good uh, for uh, my uh, formerly famished but now nauseous conveyancer. In Schindler and Pickled, um, the defendant served a notice to complete but didn't comply with an arrangement uh, whereby a sub-purchaser was meant to be visiting the premises. And in those cases, P refused to complete and sought the return of the deposit. Um, it was held that the vendor could not take advantage of their own default in failing to allow access. And so there was a wide discretion given by the court uh, under Section 49.2 of the LPA, which would be exercised in favour of P. Um, it has also been held that an order can only be contemplated where there are some special circumstances, making it unfair or inequitable uh, that the purchaser should lose his deposit, um, see coal and roads. Um, but that's been regarded as too narrow an approach in Universal Corporation and Five Way Ways Properties, 1979, One All England, uh, at 552, uh, and in that case, Lord Justice Buckley expressly approved the um, broad description of the court's discretion uh, as described in Schindler. Uh, that decision uh, was applied in Dinsdale Development Southeast Limited versus Dehan, uh, where the vendor had suffered damage but sold at a greater profit. Uh, and it was held that the justice of the case required repayment of the deposit but only on condition that the purchaser agreed to a deduction uh, which represented the vendor's damages. And uh, what difference is there in the approach to the return of deposits? Well, um, Lord, um, Mr Justice Newberg, as he then was, in Tenaro Limited and Majorac Limited, 2003 EWHC 2601, um, 
adopted a more equitable approach. Uh, in that case, deposits were returned where the value of two flats had risen and resale without loss was possible. But by way of contrast, in that case, a third deposit remained forfeit because the failure to complete was due to lack of funds and the value of the flat had fallen. By contrast, in Omar and El Wakil, 2001 EWCA Civ 1090, uh, Lady Justice Arden adopted a rather stricter approach. And what she said um, was that the starting point must be that although section 49.2 is expressed in open textured terms, leaving it to the courts to determine, determine the organizing principles, the court must bear in mind that payment in question was a deposit that is an earnest for performance and that accordingly there should not be relief simply because the contract never took place. Uh, the meaning of fairness in any given situation is context specific. The context here is of a conveyancing transaction. It is common knowledge that if a purchaser pays a deposit, he is likely to forfeit it if he does not fulfill the contract. Moreover, deposits are very usual features of conveyancing transactions, and conveyancing transactions are common. It's important there should be certainty attaching to the consequences of paying a deposit. Now, uh, that uh, approach um, was followed in the case of Middle and Park Estates 2008 EWCA, Civ 1227, in which Lord Justice Carnworth, as he then was, regarded the considered guidance given in Omar uh, as virtually binding, um, and he upheld the judge's decision in that case uh, and considered that there was a distinction because um, in the case he was considering, uh, the sale had been some months after the date for completion, which distinguished the case from Tenaro. Uh, he considered there was nothing to suggest the price rise was exceptional uh, and in those circumstances there was no obvious reason why the purchaser should have the benefit of the price rise. Uh, indeed it was the vendor that had assumed the risk um, and indeed the cost of holding on to the property um, and he uh, agreed with the first instance judge uh, that uncertainty should be avoided. And so what is the Penalty, penalties doctrine and how does that relate to deposits? Um, the penalties doctrine is a general uh, contractual principle uh, which uh, holds that uh, contractual terms which are penal in nature are not enforceable by the parties. Now deposits have long been regarded as an exception to this general rule, uh, because they are an earnest. They're not genuine pre-estimates of loss likely to be incurred in the event of breach. Um, so traditionally, they are an exception to the general rule that penalties are unlawful. And how are the courts likely to treat excessive deposits? Um, the most important um, and authoritative case to date on, on this issue is, of course, Cavendish Square Holdings, BV, and L. Macdessy, 2015 UK Supreme Court 67. Now, in that case, the Supreme Court confirmed, first of all, uh, that um, uh, there was no uh, prohibition against the forfeiture of the customary 10% uh, deposit, but um, it uh, held that the test was now whether the penalty imposed a detriment on the contract breaker out of all proportion to any legitimate interest of the innocent party in the enforcement of, of the primary obligation. Um, so uh, to that extent, the Supreme Court has clarified the different approaches um, that may have been adopted uh, in some cases to do with deposits uh, when one's dealing with a penalty. And um, it, Sorry, so what are the consequences, Karen? Well, in, in conventional cases, um, in most, most conventional cases of 10% deposit, that's unlikely to be considered a penalty. Um, it's likely to be unrecoverable in the event of breach. But the Supreme Court emphasised that between 
uh, commercial parties of equal bargaining power, the presumption must be that the parties themselves are the best judges uh, of what's legitimate. Um, so my own view is um, that uh, it's those cases where there's um, a lack of clarity in the contract and the parties are unequal that these questions and the difficult questions are most likely to arise. Um, further, in those cases where the deposit exceeds the 10% long established practice, special circumstances must be shown if it's not to be treated as an unenforceable um, penalty. The conduct of the parties remains relevant. And so, for example, um, it might be said if, if the source of the funds for the deposit were illegal, in such a case, uh, I would suggest uh, that those funds may well not be recovered. Uh, but I am actually involved in a case at the moment that's been remitted from the Court of Appeal. Uh, and so uh, we may update this uh, webinar in due course <laughs> to give the outcome uh, once we have more certainty on that point. I, I think um, just finally, uh, it's worth mentioning uh, the Westwood case, uh, Vivian Westwood Limited <laughs> and Conduit Street Development. That, that's not a deposit case. Uh, but it was one um, where payment for higher rent was regarded as exorbitant and unconscionable, uh, and so uh, was considered to be a penalty and thus unenforceable. So to wrap up those um, provisions in the context of my uh, solicitor and perhaps give her a, a better Christmas present than the bistro lunch, which nearly cost her her career, um, let's just assume uh, that in her case, the deposit was 50%. There don't appear uh, to be any um, basis for arguing that there are special circumstances um, which would render it something other than an unenforceable penalty. Uh, and so, happily, the deposit is recovered. Great, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Um, so, we're going to have we've got a few minutes of questions. Um, Hopefully, I'm just going to try and stop sharing this now. Uh, one second. And see if I can get these up. See if I can get rid of this. Uh, one second. Okay, yeah, will the recording be shared? Yes, that's uh, been confirmed. Uh, I think that that I don't I, unless unless there's anything else. Uh, I think that that's that's it, and we've actually pretty much uh, there on time anyway. Um, so yeah. so what I'm going to suggest is that if anyone's got any follow up questions or um, uh, queries relating to particular cases, uh, our email addresses are on the final slide, which I hope you've seen. Um, it's Kerry dot Essex dot com and uh, alexander.burrell at 39essex.com. Uh, so please feel free to contact us directly uh, and thank you for tuning in today. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for me as well. Uh, yeah, likewise, if, if you want to get a case reference or anything, as Kerry has suggested, then don't hesitate to get in contact with our clerks or with us directly. Uh, thank you very much.